series, Visio Day, refocusing our image of God. And in this series, we're looking at some pretty big pieces of things that make up uh, who we know God to be, and just making sure that what we know of him is actually what's said in the Bible and is actually what is true, because sometimes over time what can happen is our vision of God can get a little morphed, it shifts a little bit. So this series is all about just making sure we still have 2020 vision on who our God is. Today, we are going to be talking about how Jesus meets us in our messy reality. And I want to just kick things off by telling you guys of a time Jesus met me in my messy reality. There is like a plethora of stories I can choose from, but I'm going to just share this one. So when I was 18, this was the time in my life that I had my come to Jesus moment, and I became not just like a part-time kind of Christian, I became a full-fledged lover of Jesus, and it was really great. Thank you. Thank you. One other person here is excited to love Jesus. We'll, we'll work on this. And it, yeah, it was my mom, yeah. Um, <laughs> anyways, yeah, she's very happy I came to Christ. It was good. It's good for all of us. Um, anyways, I came to know Jesus. I was um, a mess, and I didn't even really know what to do about it. I felt that I wasn't good enough, I could never do enough, and that I was too far gone for God's plans for my life. And in this chaotic mess that was going on in my head and my heart, God just met me there. And after that, after I really knew that Jesus was who he said he was, and after I really knew that God fully loved me and saw me, um, I think I had this expectation that things were going to be a little bit easier from there. Yes, I hear some laughter. That is correct. That's not what happened. Um, God met me in my messy reality when I was like a half Christian, not really Christian. Um, But then after I became a fully committed follower of Christ, um, I still had to go to him. I still had to welcome him into my messy reality because the truth was that even though I was um, a more committed Christian, I was still struggling with all kinds of things. And I still needed God's help because I just couldn't do it by myself, and I was still a mess. And so that was, I don't know how many years ago, that was like five years ago, and every single day, I've still remained a mess, and I'm a mess in front of you here today, so thank you for having me. I'm just like, every day, it's just like a little bit, a little bit of a different mess, you know? So it's fine. Keep you on your toes. You're like, ooh, here's a new sin. That's good. So (laughs) anyways, we are going to be talking today. We're going to be looking at a story in Luke, and in this story, we see God meet with Simon Peter in his messy reality. So let's take a look. One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push him into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked, all, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish that they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened... Oh, thank you so much. When Simon Peter had realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said... Oh, Lord, please leave me. I am such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. So in this story, we get to kind of see Simon Peter through the stages. He kicks things off, and he's just kind of like a regular Joe, a regular old Simon, actually. And uh, he starts there, and we can see that he's a nice guy. He's listening to Jesus. He's um, going and helping him, pushing out the boat, and listening to him speak. But he doesn't really seem to fully comprehend the weight of what Jesus has to say, that he is the Messiah, that he is the King of Kings, that he is like God. Um, But he's a nice guy, so he's helping him out, and we see that even the fact that he's just there, he's just there like doing his job. He's cleaning his nets from the night before of fishing, which was like his profession, and 
in the passage as well, it says that like that whole night they hadn't caught a single thing. So he's there just being a nice guy, helping out Jesus. And then Jesus, after he's done preaching on his boat, says to him, okay, put down your, oh, what's that thing? Net. <laughs> put down your net. And he does, but he tells Jesus, we haven't caught anything. And this situation also, this is what I love, well, one of the things I love about this story, is Jesus, who, like, we know, like, God does miracles and awesome stuff, but Jesus is known as a carpenter, that's what he did, that was his trade, and he was like a preacher, he was a teacher, that was the other thing he did. And this other guy was a fisherman, like, that was, that's what he did, he was fishing, this whole story is about him and fish, and he was like, I know you have to go in the evenings, Simon Peter knows this, and I know you have to go in shallow water. And the carpenter tells him, go in deep water, in the middle of the day. And he's like, okay. So he goes, out of, out of obedience, he goes and he does this, but I think his expectations are probably very low of what is going to happen. But our God performs miracles, and the fact that he went in the middle of the day in deep water was not a coincidence, right? Simon Peter knows fish, he knows when they're out, he knows where to go for them, and that's not it. So this was a miracle from God, that he put down his net, and it was an abundant amount of fish that he caught. So much, in fact, he had to call over another boat and tell them, we need your help so that we can fit all of our fish in these two boats. And then both boats started to sink. Madness. And it was this moment, like I had my come to Jesus moment, and this is Simon Peter's come to Jesus moment, that he realizes that Jesus is actually who he's been saying that he is, that Jesus is so powerful, that he is the king of everything, that he is like free of sin, and that he is the perfect living God. So, after he realizes this, this is what happens. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me, I'm such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish that they had caught, as were the others with him. So he says, Oh Lord, please leave me, I'm such a sinful man. So this is Simon's realization that Jesus is really who is in front of him, and he feels so unworthy being with, like, being with God. And because of this, his response is pretty normal, pretty natural to feel like I'm unworthy to be in this present of this all-knowing great God. But even though he says, I'm sinful, confesses to God, goes to God honestly with how he's feeling and who he is, which wasn't seen before, right? Before he was being like this nice guy, and then suddenly he realizes who Jesus is, and he has this like 180, that he's like, oh my goodness, and it's just all his walls are just broken down, and he's honest and real and vulnerable in front of Jesus, and tells him, I am a sinful man, go away from me. But what does Jesus do? Does he say, Yep, that really sucks for you. You're a sinner. I didn't know that. So I'm out of here. Does he say, I'm so surprised and shocked by this news. I can't believe it. Does he say, I'm now going to yell at you for half an hour because you are sinful? No, he doesn't actually do any of that. Also, this is a side note. I think sometimes when we think about sin in God and how he's going to respond when we confess things to him or like when, yeah, when we tell him we've done something wrong, I think often we can think that he's going to respond like um, other authority figures in our lives and it could be very uh, unhealthy or not great responses that we've gotten in the past. So we may think that we had a parent who yelled at us a lot or we had a parent that would give us the silent treatment or we had a parent that would like take away all of our things because we did things wrong. We had a parent that whatever their response was, and maybe it's someone who wasn't a parent as well, but just any kind of a situation where you were like honest and vulnerable and you showed your brokenness and you confessed to something that you did and the response was just like through you and hurt you more. Um, that's not who our God is. That's not what he's about. Our God does not respond in that way in this situation. In fact, Jesus hearing that Simon Peter is sinful says, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. So he's not scared. First of all, he doesn't run away from Simon Peter. He's not saying, how dare you be full of sin? Because God knows that we're all sinners. So it's never surprising to him to find out that we are sinful people. He knows. I just realized I was talking so fast. And I was trying to be better to not do that. So I just clocked myself. Okay. So he said, don't be afraid. <laughs> From now on, you'll be fishing for people. 
So because of this now, we can see that, first of all, the first thing that Jesus says is do not be afraid. So he cares about how Simon Peter is feeling. He can see the fear that he's experiencing after this confession. And Jesus really, really cares to just meet him where he is, to validate what he's feeling, and to tell him, you do not have to be afraid. After that, Jesus doesn't say, but also, I'm very angry at you. He says, from now on, you'll be fishing for people. So this means that after he's heard, he just just heard that Simon Peter is a sinful man, and he's saying, now join me on my mission. Now come and fish for people instead of for the fish. Instead, you're now going to be saving people, is what he's saying. You're going to be sharing with them the good news of who I am. And Simon Peter leaves everything and follows Jesus, which is wild. That's the whole thing too, right? The whole miracle that made him come to Jesus was him catching all these fish. He just left the fish. I don't know what happened to them, but they're not with him. That's wild. Okay, moving on. Um, she said, don't be afraid. That was so good. So we need to invite God into our messy reality because this actually brings us closer to God. When Simon Peter said, get away from me, I think he thought because he was so full of sin that then God was going to distance himself, in this case, Jesus. That Jesus was going to distance himself and say, oh, I don't hang out with sinners. That's not for me. But that's not what we see happen, right? When he actually confessed and when he was vulnerable and just real with Jesus, instead of being further away from Jesus, he became closer with him. So when we confess to Jesus what's going on in our hearts, what's going on in our lives, what we're doing wrong, what we're struggling with, this isn't something that makes us distant from God. It's something that actually brings us closer. Because a lot of the time when we're feeling distant from God because we're struggling with our sin, it's because we're not letting him be a part of it. Sin is obviously not in God's makeup for this world. It's not something he wants any of us to experience or go through, but he knows that we're all sinners, and he knows that we all struggle, so he just wants to be invited in to walk with us. Because or else sometimes what we can do is we can say, I'm going to solve this sin on my own. When I'm better, then I'll go to God, and then that'll be better that way, or I'm really ashamed or embarrassed or I feel guilty, so I'm not going to tell God about it, and I'm going to try to hide it. And this is like, this, also this image, let me tell you what it is. In my head it makes sense, but I didn't explain it. This is you, and this is you pushing away God, right? Because you're saying, I don't want to be totally open. I'm going to give God like 30% of myself, and hopefully that's enough. But God wants all of you. God made you. He's not surprised by your sinful ways. He's not surprised by anything you throw at him. He's like, great, and I love you, and let me walk with you through this. So he doesn't want you to be going through any of this alone. Like we saw with Simon Peter, right? He confesses, and Jesus says, awesome, follow me, be a part of my plans. And that's the same thing that we are called to. God has a plan for us, and we're invited in that, even though we're all sinners. Also, there would be no one to do God's work otherwise, because they, they would just be Jesus. So it's good that he uses sinners, was my point. Okay, we're going to go to slide number four. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. So sometimes we can feel like we should maybe say we don't sin, or we want to pretend like sin doesn't really affect us, but that's not true, right? We all struggle with sin, although they might all be different sins. It's all something that we have a hard time with. But when we're honest that sin is something we struggle with, um, we can bring it to God, and if, if, we can, whoa, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So God's sitting there waiting for us, and he wants to forgive us. He's sitting there just like excited to hear from us. No matter what it is, he wants to walk with us. So he wants to forgive you of your sins, no matter how big or small you feel they are, and wants to just journey with you. So bad, so bad, that's what he wants. Um, so we are all sinners and pretending that we are not 
or trying to hide our sin, um, yeah, it doesn't create that unity that we want with God, that we desire. Instead, it just creates this division, right? So we need to be um, honest and authentic and real with him. So although confessing our sin is like a big thing and something that is so, so important for us to do, for us to do this, we need to first acknowledge the sin within ourselves. So we need to first recognize who are we, what are the things we're struggling with, and kind of show up really um, real and authentically with ourselves so that we can then go to God and be honest and real um, with him as well. Um, so I feel like a lot of the time we can feel that what we need to do is show up like better than we are. We need to, yeah, we need to say that we're great all the time. We need to kind of like pretend we're doing okay, even if we're going through a hard time. We need to just like put your best foot forward and stuff like that, only post the nice pictures. And uh, yeah, we just kind of live in a world that brings on this pressure for us to be our best and to only show our best. So it's hard then to be like, okay, but now let me be vulnerable and let me be real. So this is something we have to really practice because although we can feel the pressure that we need to really just show like our best side and be, you know, who people expect us to be or who we think we should be, God doesn't want that. He doesn't want who you think you should be now. He doesn't want who you think you should be in 10 years. He doesn't want who you were. He wants you exactly as you are in this very moment. And that is what makes our God so good. He cares for who we are as people in this moment, as sinful people, as people that are struggling. And the, like, the moment we're in right now, guys, you feel it? This is the moment. God wants to meet with you right now. And it's how you are now is enough. And he loves you exactly as you are. And in a week from now, that moment, when you're in that moment, God's going to want to meet you the same. And so on and so on and so on. The present moment that you are in, that's the only time you can connect with God, right? That's where he lives. And so we need to meet with him in the present moment so that he can speak to us, he can walk with us, and so that he can just see who we are fully. So... Walking away from wanting to be perfect to God and instead choosing to show him who we are honestly, vulnerably, authentically, all the things that can be really, really, really scary, but letting God into that is so good and so powerful. And one last verse I want to show you guys, actually. Um, all about us being sinners and about uh, the glory of God and all this good stuff, so let me read it. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all, are just, just, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so has to be just and the ones who justified those who have faith in Jesus. I think, yeah, that's right. Okay, so Jesus wants to forgive us so much so that he died for our sins. God cares so much about who we are, about being in relationship with us, that although sin was not a part of his design, sin was something that separated us, he sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. Jesus was perfect and flawless and wonderful, and we are broken. But God knew that, and God said, have Jesus as this like atoning sacrifice to go in your place so that then you will know not only that you are loved, but then your sins will be paid for already so that we can just be in a relationship and be together. So this is what God desires from us. He wants to meet us in our messy reality as it is right now, not our messy reality that's like a little bit cleaned up, not only 50% of our messy reality, but all of the messy reality that we have for him because he loves us so, so dearly and he cares for how we're doing and he wants us to have the best life possible and he wants to help us to be able to walk in his light and walk in his path. And uh, we can only do that through actually going to him, confessing to him and uh, following his ways. So I'm just gonna end things off by praying. God, 
I thank you so much that you are here right now, that you are always there just waiting for us to let you in so that you can be a part of our messy reality, God. I thank you that you care so, so deeply for all of your children, that you just want us to know you and that you want to know us completely and fully exactly as we are, Lord. You, you know our hearts. You know what we need to say to you today. You know what we need to give to you, God. And you love us no matter what. I pray you would give us the courage to be completely authentic with you and to show all our broken pieces, God. Help us to just be 100% ourselves with you. That's what you desire. I thank you for the love you have for all of us here, God. And I pray we would just meet with you today. Amen. Are you pumped? This is not a question. This is just oh. a word of affirmation. <laughs> just, to, just to share this with you. Not a question to be asked, but would love to see Katrin speak more often. Her passion is evident and emotionally resonates with me. I just want to share that with you. I'm going to cry again, so let's, let's not. <laughs> but thank you. Here is the first question. I loved your point that if God was not with us in our mess and sin, there'd be no one to use, to, there'd be no one to use but Jesus. Why do you think there are some people who believe they are all good and everyone else is broken? Oh. Um, that's, that's quite the question. Like, I guess there's a couple ways. Like, they think that they're, like, they are free of sin. Like, they just think they're not sinners. Sure, let's take it that way. That seems I'm guessing right. that could imply that, yeah. Great. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think there's a few reasons. This is, this is very much response. I have no idea. I think that that would be um, a personal thing. I think there can be sometimes fear associated with it of, like, acknowledging your own sin can be really scary. And I think also this can sometimes be, um, yeah, oh, just a really negative thing, and I think we can all kind of do it, where we judge others because it's just easier, and sometimes that can make us feel better about ourselves to acknowledge that other people are messing up, maybe it seems like even more than us, or like you can really see their sin, and I think that sometimes that can just like stem from uh, just insecurities or like our own hurt and pain, but we're definitely all sinners, so I think that it's just like it is definitely like an incorrect thought to think like I'm all good and everyone else is the problem. So I think there needs to be some self-reflection there if that's mm. how, how you feel. Yeah. Yeah. Let me follow up with this question. Yes. Um, there, there are, well, okay, there are two that came. I'll, I'll read them both to you. Perhaps we can unpack them. Okay. Will God forgive me if I keep doing the same sin over and over again? How do I change the negative pattern of my sin? In addition to that, I'll, I'll just add this because I think it ties into what you just said. My life feels so messy that I don't think I'm worthy of God's love and forgiveness. I feel mm -hmm. like I shouldn't even be here this morning because I'm so broken. Mm -hmm. So there is a person who clearly has a self-awareness or is confronted by the reality of this. So to go back to the questions then, will God forgive me if I keep doing the same sin over and over again? How do I change the negative pattern of my sin? Yeah. That's, that's such a tricky one because I think those repetitive sins, um, they really just like sneak up on you and they make you kind of feel like trapped because you're like, I already asked, how many times can I ask for forgiveness for this same thing? Um, but God doesn't get tired of forgiving us, right? Like the cross, Jesus, all of that, it's forgiveness for all of our sins. Now this, this I think is where people can get um, maybe confused is like, oh, so I can just do whatever and then I just go, sorry, Jesus, and then it's fine. And that's not what it is, right? Like when we understand how good our God is and that why he doesn't want us to sin is because he wants what's best for us, that makes us want to turn away from sin because we realize like God's ways are better than our own. Um, so it's not like taking advantage of God to be struggling in the same sin. Um, so don't feel like guilt or shame or like you need to like hide that or anything. Like we all have sins like that. I definitely have sins that I feel like it's been years that it's just like, okay, 
this one again. And it's really exhausting to kind of work with those, but God doesn't get tired of forgiving us. Like God wants us to uh, go to him so he can forgive us, whether it's the first time we do this sin or the one millionth time. Um, And especially like he just wants to walk with you. That part is so, so important. When we keep inviting God in, then he keeps wanting to just like journey with us and help us and reveal new things to us. But just, yeah, some sins are harder for us to let go of, but don't let that feel like that is just a you experience. That is something that is, I think, true for, if not everyone, almost everyone, definitely myself. So just keep bringing it to God, I would say. Mm. Okay, next one. Who was it? You're ready. I'm ready. <laughs> um, continuing the theme. I do believe that Jesus accepts people in their brokenness. Mm-hmm. The church, not so much. How can we get better at accepting all where they are at here at TMP? Mm. Yeah, so good. I think that uh, that is so true. The church has caused a lot of hurt in the past. And I think this is a piece that it's like so important for you to be aware of like, what is it that I believe and know to be true of God? Because God is not the church, right? The church is built of broken people and broken people are gonna like sin and mess up and all this stuff. So it really sucks that in the past and currently, right? Like we, people in the church keep, messing up and keep falling short and keep like doing these things that just like suck and don't represent who God is. So I think for us in the church wanting to make a change to be more Christ-like, we need to really like invest in that ourselves. So we need to really make sure that we are going to God and that we are learning more of who he is and what he Um, yeah, what he says and how he cares for people. Like, God is all about love. So I think that's really the very first thing is, like, loving everyone. It's not our job to be uh, the judger. That is all God. And so if we ever feel like we have, like, judgment really in us for people, especially that, like, we don't know, that is really not, like, not it. That's not what we're about. So we are called to love people first and foremost, like God loves us. So I think to kind of be the change in the church, like we have to really put in that work. We need to reflect on, are we showing up the way we think God wants to? Are we reflecting um, how he wants the church to be? So I think it really just like starts, starts with us. Thank you. Thank you. you. (laughs) There was, sorry, can I say one thing? Please. There was a thing you said before. I thought it was going to be a two-part question and we were going to go back to it. It was, there was a piece of it. Do I need to find it though? I think I can remember. It was, okay, go ahead. It was, something, it was something about feeling like, I think it was feeling like you're too far gone in sin. And I just was like, no, that's not true. And I think we're all, like we all have different journeys and we all have different experiences and we all, our sin is all different, but there is not a single one of us that can say, oh, I'm good, I'm fine. And there's not a single one of us that it's like, oh, our sin is worse in God's eyes all sin is equal. So if you're feeling too far gone, know that that's not from God, that he has great plans for you and he wants to use you for something so awesome. And that if you're feeling like, oh my goodness, like I'm, it's, there's nothing. Like I felt like that. That's actually like exactly my testimony was feeling like God had no plan for me and I had messed up too many times and it's just not true. It's not who he created you to be. And you're probably actually meant for something so awesome because there's someone who clearly doesn't want you to feel like God does have a plan for you, but he does. So just know like that's just, you being too far gone is not true. God does have something amazing in store for you. Yeah. That was it, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not about those lies, you know? Right. Yeah. Would you bless us to yes, thank close you. our service? Well, thank you all so much for uh, coming here this morning and for just being a part of this service today. I just pray that as you leave here, as you leave here today, this week, you would just be able to meet God in new ways, that you would be able to experience him in a really just authentic, honest way that you would be able to sit with yourself and be able to kind of just reflect on the things that maybe uh, you need to give to God, that you need to confess, and yeah, just take the time this week to be present and to meet with God so that he can step into your messy reality and walk with you. Go in peace.